Our first speaker is Dr. William Keaton. Dr. Keaton is a professor of forest ecology and forestry at the University of Vermont in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. He is chair of the forestry program and leads the Carbon Dynamics Laboratory. Dr. Keaton received his bachelor's uh, in natural resources from Cornell University, his master's at the uh, Yale University in biology, and he holds a PhD in forest ecology from the University of Washington. His current research focuses on carbon dynamics, forest management, climate change impacts, ecologically based silviculture, forest stream interactions, and forest biodiversity. Dr. Keaton's talk is entitled Management of Old Growth Characteristics and Late Successional Biodiversity in Temperate Montane Forests. Thanks very much for that introduction, and, and thanks to all of you guys for coming. Um, actually, as you can see, I've retitled my talk, and this is one of the dangers of, of growing older. You become increasingly tempted to say what you actually want to say and what you actually mean. And so I, I thought I would do that today and, and give this the title that I really wanted, which was Carbon, Mushrooms, and Timber, What More Could You Want? And I'll be reporting on 15 years of work that we've been doing with uh, the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. So this is a project called the F Vermont Forest Ecosystem Management Demonstration Project that we established soon after I arrived at UVM back in 2000 with Sandy Wilmot's help and, and the help of many other people. And, and I'm excited today to actually try to weave together a whole variety of different studies that we've done over the years and, and tell you a, a more complete story of what we've found. So, uh, before I get into it, I also want to acknowledge, though, that a lot of people have contributed to this work over the years. Many students in my lab, um, also other collaborators from outside, but specifically Sarah Ford, Jared Nunnery, Kimberly Smith, Heather McKenney, Nicholas Dove, Aviva Gottesman, Andrea Urbano, and others, and, and actually I'll present, be presenting some of their work today as, as part of this talk. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of context, this study is essentially about managing for late successional and old growth forest characteristics. And you might wonder, why is that a worthwhile objective? Why is that an important endeavor? I'll put this first into the context of biodiversity. I think it's important to remember that when we're talking about biodiversity, we need to be thinking big. We need to be thinking about all forms of bio biodiversity, not just one guild or the species associated with a particular seral stage, but we need to think about the full range of d d diversity out there on the landscape associated with all different seral stages and successional stages. So of course, there's a lot of interest these days in managing for early successional species in that particular guild and that's completely fine. But we also need to think about the late successional species and the habitat characteristics that they need. And it's really by having habitat represented for all of those species on the landscape that we optimize that full array of biodiversity that's out there. So I'm just gonna be complimenting, or I'm sorry, concentrating on, on this end of the diversity spectrum today. Before I get into that, though, I do want to put this into a, a larger global context, which, I, which I've actually never done before for VMC, and, and I thought it might be fun to do that today. This whole idea of managing for late successional structure and diversity and functions is not just a Vermont idea. I would say that, if anything, actually the, the origin of, of this kind of silviculture and forestry was in the Pacific Northwest back in the late 80s, concepts like new forestry, and ecological forestry, later became uh, incorporated into systems like variable retention harvesting, and then even more recently, concepts like disturbance-based forestry. And then from there, those ideas kind of emanated out and percolated to other parts of the world. So for instance, in Maine, you have Bob Seymour's great work on the expanding gap Femmelschlag system, similar artificial or silvicultural gap-based studies in the upper Midwest, some of Anthony D'Amato's work and, and others there. In Europe, you have various different manifestations of this kind of research, uh, variably called close to nature silviculture if you're in Eastern Europe, or natural dynamic silviculture if you're in Scandinavia. The French and Germans call it dower walled or continuous cover forestry, all different variants of this. And even in Australia, David Lindenmeyer's work in 
in uh, eucalyptus regnans forests, looking at various different retention harvesting systems. And so the, the idea then of using silviculture as a tool to manage for structural complexity, stands that are perhaps more complex than would be the result of more traditional forestry approaches, has kind of taken off. And, and it's exciting then that the Vermont study is now within this much larger family of silvicultural systems that are being tested. Okay, so now we'll step it back down to New England and kind of put it into context here. You know, why, why is this important here? How does it fit within our landscape? I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with the history of forest change in New England. I don't really need to review that, but to just kind of summarize it really quickly, you can think of it this way in terms of the age class distributions that we've had on our landscape over time, and this is just broken down into the three very simple classes, young, mature, and old growth, and we've got percent cover here on the y-axis. Oops, this is a little tricky. Now I'm see, I see why uh, folks were struggling with it. Jim, could I get a little bit of help to go backwards? Oh, here we go. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so this is basically the age class distribution that we might have had on the landscape pre-European settlement, a landscape dominated by late successional forests with somewhere between 1 and 10 percent in a young condition. And that's based on witness tree records and kind of our best reconstructions of what that landscape might have looked like. And then, of course, we all know that by the mid-19th century, the majority of the landscape had been cleared at various times and was then dominated by an open or early successional condition. And then, of course, with land abandonment and movement west, forests recover, and now we have this bubble on the landscape of kind of young to mature forests that is purely an artifact of that land use history. And so this is a, an opportunity in many ways. I love... Um, Mike Snyder's comment about sort of how that we've uh, accidentally inherited this, this opportunity. And we can think about what we might want to do with this bubble. And of course, there's a great deal of interest in maybe moving some of it towards that early successional condition and managing for some of those species. <clears throat> but we can also think about moving some of this bubble towards a late successional condition. And those two objectives are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? We can try both of them in different places on the landscape. Okay, so what would those characteristics be that we're, that we're thinking about managing for? <clears throat> There's a lot I could say about this. I'll just kind of summarize it with a nice picture this time. I took this picture just a few weeks ago with my forest dynamics class over in the Adirondacks in one of the old growth forests that we work in there. And I, I think it kind of captures pretty clearly the, the characteristics that we're trying to promote. Things like uh, higher densities of larger trees, but certainly trees of all sizes and ages. Vertically complex canopies, horizontal variation in forest structure, gaps, non-gaps, deadwood in all of its various manifestations, snags, uh, down woody debris, soil, carbon, all of those things. And all of these different aspects of stand structure are what will yield those late successional species that depend on those characteristics. Okay, then one, one more slide on kind of that global context before we get into the meat of the Vermont study. I, I thought it was interesting maybe to, to take a look at the, the data on old growth forests globally, which we published in, in this paper a couple years ago. This is a study that reviewed published data from something like 400 studies of old growth forests around the world. The, the, x-axis there are different types of, of forest systems in different parts of the world. And then we have just two different kind of structural indicators of late successional condition, coarse woody debris volumes and then large tree densities here. These are complicated box plots, but the, the point here is that when we start comparing age classes globally, and these are just temperate forests, by the way, not tropical or boreal, and we look at the error bars around some of these things. So for instance, we'll use coarse woody debris as an example, comparing mature forests globally to old growth forests globally. Notice that there's a lot of overlap here in, these error in, in those error bars and that range of variability. And, and that's really interesting to us as ecologists and silviculturists because we can say that, sure, there's some real distinctions between old growth and younger forests, but there's also a huge amount of variability out there in nature. 
associated with uh, disturbance histories and site variability and all those sorts of things. And that's actually really good news, I think, for foresters and for silviculturalists because it suggests that there's actually a wide range of conditions and structures that we might consider managing for. We're not tied down to a single silvicultural approach. We can mix it up. We can try different things in different places. Okay, so that brings us to the Vermont Forest Ecosystem Management Demonstration Project. Um, this is just a, a shot of one of the main study areas on the west side of Mount Mansfield, on the Mount Mansfield State Forest there. Uh, this was a study that was initiated in 2001. We had two years of pretreatment data collection, plot establishment, that sort of thing. We implemented the experimental harvest in the winter of 2003, and then we've had close to 12 years of post-harvest or post-treatment data collection since then. And so now that gives us a really pretty nice kind of longer-term record then of, of forest responses to these silvicultural treatments. Long-term study testing effects of disturbance-based silvicultural treatments. Okay, so in addition to the Mount Mansfield site, we've also used um, data from treatment units at Jericho Forest, and we've uh, borrowed or shared data with a, a, some Similar tr uh, treatments at Paul Smith College in the Adirondacks where they've tested some of the other uh, selection harvesting systems like single tree selection and group selection that we've been comparing against. So to make a very long st story short, the study compares an approach called structural complexity enhancement. That's the late successional or old growth promotion approach. Uh, to several different modified selection harvesting systems, a modified single tree selection system and a modified group selection system. And then, of course, we also have controls or untreated or unmanipulated units at these sites as well. Actually, I'm going to go back to that one for a second. The, the structural complexity enhancement treatment involves a whole variety of different sorts of things, everything from crown-releasing larger trees to enhancing the availability of large snags and down woody debris, small gap creation, creating variable horizontal structure through variable density marking, those kinds of approaches. But it, it's, it's only subtly different from a, a more conventional single tree selection approach. These are nuanced differences, slight tweaks to things like residual diameter distributions and, and those sorts of things. We could spend a lot of time on the silviculture, but unfortunately I don't have that time today, but happy to answer questions later if, if you're interested. Okay, gap creation is, is a part of this, of course, and, and really the difference in this study between the treatments is just the sort of average size of gaps and variability of gap sizes and differences in structural retention within gaps, th those sorts of things. Okay, so now a little bit about the actual responses. What have we found? We have a lot of great data on biodiversity responses from a number of different indicator taxa that we've used. Understory plants, salamanders, birds, soil invertebrates. Um, I don't have time to give it all to you today, so I thought I would just show you some of the most recent and, in my opinion, most exciting results as an example. So one of the things that we've looked at most recently uh, is the fungal responses to these silvicultural treatments. And again, having 12 years of data now, that's something that we can actually start looking at. You know, the fungal communities are, are rather slow to respond to something like this, but 10 or 12 years out, we can actually start seeing a response. So, so these are some data that Nicholas Dove collected for a, an undergraduate senior's honor, honors project, actually, a couple of years ago. And what you're seeing is the tremendous response in the fungal community to the structural complexity enhancement treatment as compared to the conventional treatments and the controls. So this is an increase in species richness that is significantly greater. And you might be wondering, well, what kinds of, of fungi are we talking about? Are those just the decomposers that are you know, breaking down the woody debris that you're creating? And, and yes, that, that's some of them. But actually, the richness 
transcends all the different guilds of fungi that we've looked at, and it includes the really beneficial mycorrhizal fungi below ground. It also includes edible and harvestable mushrooms. This, these data, by the way, are just above ground sporocarps, so fruiting mushrooms. But this is really exciting to me, that through this kind of silviculture, we can produce both, uh, I'm sorry, enhance both the uh, mycorrhizal fungi as well as harvestable mushrooms. So this should make the uh, mushroom collectors in the room really excited. Okay, so we can do a lot of fancy kind of multivariate analysis as well to figure out what's really driving that fungal response. Is it just the, the treatment itself or is it a particular aspect of the treatment? What is it specifically that the fungi are responding to? So this is something called a, cl a classification and regression tree where you can answer a question like that. What we're seeing then is the, the primary predictors of fungal response on this decision tree here. So the change uh, in fungal, fungi richness is this dependent variable here at the bottom. The, the strongest predictors of that response are arrayed here through this decision tree. And not surprisingly, it was things like, of course, woody debris volume, especially in very well decay classes of, of woody debris. Also things like snag densities. Um, and then just sort of an overall response to in, uh, increasing biomass as well in the structural complexity treatment. So in any case, all these things I think are, are promising and, and exciting. All right, so I promised you some, some data on carbon. So really quickly, some carbon data. Now these are Sarah Ford's data. She did these for her master's thesis that she just defended a few weeks ago. <clears throat> this is a rather complicated figure, box plots showing you um, mean carbon and, and variances in carbon comparing the three general categories of treatments, controls, conventional selection systems, and structural complexity enhancement. And we have four different uh, ca carbon pools here. And, and the, really the only reason I, I put this slide up was to show you that we've put a lot of work into quantifying these carbon pools. And we have that now for the pre-treatment data, 2001, immediately post-treatment 2003, and then 10 years later in 2013. So we can really take a hard look at, at long-term carbon responses. This is exciting for me because so much of the carbon research these days relies on simulation models, right? It's mostly projections of carbon responses. And that's important work, but here we have actual empirical data on, on long-term carbon responses. So we can, we can you know, paint a different picture. <clears throat> okay, so a really important aspect of the carbon responses is to understand how those individual sites that we've harvested might have, have accumulated carbon had they not been treated at all. So what would have happened if we just left them alone? And this is really important for normalizing our data because there's so much site level variation out there. A wide range of site productivities and initial conditions in these stands and so we need to account for that. The way we did this in this study was to essentially normalize the, the measured response against a simulated response assuming no harvest, and we used the, the forest vegetation simulator as a way to do that. So that's what these numbers are here. They're the, the measured response compared to what the computer model is predicting would have happened had we not treated them at all. And so this gives us an interesting perspective. I'll just use th this one today. If we look at the live tree carbon pool, what we're seeing is that the carbon recovery, essentially, and accumulation in the structural co complexity units came very close to what would have happened had we not harvested those at all, compared to the conventional units that were actually significantly lower to the no harvest treatment. And this is actually consistent with some of the previous simulation work like Jared Nunnery and others have done that suggested that it's pretty hard to beat the unharvested forest. But really what we're doing with some of these lighter touch forestry approaches is trying to come as close to that as possible while still harvesting timber. So that's exciting to us. You might be wondering why the, why the controls decreased and that had to do some natural disturbance that, that hit those stands.
There's an even more interesting story with the standing dead carbon, but I don't have time for that today. So we'll come back to that another, another time. Okay, so I'm going to just summarize it using this graph, um, and then I promise that I'll, that I'll move on because I know I'm already over time. So this is a figure, actually, that um, some Europeans put together. I mentioned that there was this kind of global interest in old growth silviculture, right? This is a figure that Jürgen Bauhaus, the University of Freiburg in Germany, put together. And he kind of picked up on what we were doing here in Vermont, which was kind of interesting, right? The structural complexity enhancement. And they hypothesized that, okay, if we do this, you know, basically we're going to enhance the amount of carbon in a managed forest compared to what we otherwise would have had. But again, it's not really going to approach the baseline of a primary forest or an unmanaged forest. And what I can do with our data now is I can show that, yeah, actually, after 10 years, that hypothesis is pretty well supported. You know, we've come to within about 16% of what the unmanaged forest would have produced in terms of carbon compared to, again, these are Sarah's data, about 45% in the conventional units. So that's interesting. It seems to suggest that there's some real potential to use this late successional forestry also as a carbon forestry technique. Okay, so then, then finally, I promised you a little bit on timber. This will be my last data slide. It's really important, especially on a working landscape like Vermont, to, to, to look at the economics also and to put this in that context. Because, of course, every landowner wants to know, can I actually do this? And can I actually generate revenue this way? And so we've done a lot of very careful analysis on the financial side of this, tracking operational expenses, tracking revenues. And we can look at that now and we can show that, yeah, you know, the structural complexity approach actually did fairly well. It generated a moderate level of revenue that in some cases only allowed us to, to uh, break even. So that's not going to work for everybody. In other situations, it actually generated a harvest. So maybe on better sites or when market conditions are better, we can actually generate a profit this way. And there are other, other situations where we lost money. So we need to look at all those scenarios and understand when is this going to work financially. We produced about 60% of the harvest volume compared to the selection systems. So it's not going to maximize revenue, but it could pay for itself and be a part of um, you know, a, a more integrated harvesting operation in, in certain situations. Okay, I'm going to skip the regeneration data today and just conclude with this one. Okay, so this is a slide that you've seen before. I've presented it many times at VMC conferences, and I've tried to make this argument that we can think of this kind of structure-based forestry, managing for late successional characteristics in, in lots of different ways, in, in different contexts. Everything from a more timber-oriented approach where we might be managing for some of these characteristics but not others, or maybe in lower densities, um, compared to, let's say, a restoration approach where we're really doing full-on old-growth forest restoration and everything in between. And I think that we can now add carbon to the equation and we can say, actually, that if we do that, there's also kind of a s spectrum of carbon outcomes that we can think of achieving as well. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the funders, VMC, many others, and um, thank you very much for coming.